So hi, everybody. Welcome to another episode of Book Cafe Podcast. Uh, in today's episode, we will be talking about this book right here behind me entitled Negotiating with Tough Customers by Steve Riley. And I'm extremely thrilled to have the author himself uh, with us for today's episode to talk about the book. Um, I actually picked it up quite serendipitously during my travels through India. The book isn't available in Bangladesh, so I'm just really thrilled that I uh, actually got to pick it up while traveling through Delhi airport. And um, I, as a lot of you who are watching this podcast may know that I moonlight as a podcaster and YouTuber, but in my day job, I am a full-time sales director where I work with, uh, where I work in the construction industry in Bangladesh. And I work with a lot of uh, uh, wonderful you know, suppliers, including Fiam from Italy and Kone from Finland. But uh, before deep diving into all that, let me just first introduce the author. Mr. Steve Riley. Hi, Steve. Welcome to Book Cafe Podcast. Hi, Omar. Thanks for having me. So, Steve, as I mentioned, that uh, I picked up the book uh, about three years back, and it was quite serendipitous. I just saw the the title and the book cover, and I thought that, oh, wow, this is something that I really need. And I flipped through a couple of pages, and I really liked what I saw. And so, I, you know, it's been one of my go-to negotiation books over the last couple of years. And I just picked it up in the nick of time before COVID. <laughs> So I'm just really you know, thrilled and excited to be able to talk to you about it. Now, uh, Steve, uh, we'll get into the uh, nitty gritty of the book in a moment, but uh, for our viewers and listeners who might be discovering for the very first time, uh, do please take a moment to tell us a little bit more about yourself, You know, your background, where you grew up, uh, what you do for a living, anything at all that you'd like to uh, tell us. Okay, well, I'm American. It, it, people can typically guess that right off the bat, but I'm an American. And I grew up on the East Coast of the U.S. in a city called Philadelphia in a in a traditional what we call Irish Catholic family. So there's 10 children. I'm one of 10 um, and perfectly, perfectly planned parenthood, five girls, five boys. Uh, but my father, a uh, university professor at Villanova University, so I had a free university education. So my my life up until my university years was pretty much just Philadelphia's suburban, suburban life. Um, I studied international uh, languages, languages uh, mostly Spanish and German in my uh, undergraduate. And then after that, believe it or not, I worked to work for the FBI. So I worked for the FBI for a short period of time. Yes, I'm wearing my one of my FBI shirts, but people think that's glamorous, but it wasn't. I was in forensics, which is actually dealing with fingerprints, and it was quite a mundane job. So I quit that, and I went into graduate school, got a degree in international business, and then embarked on my career of uh, selling, uh, sales and sales management with different companies, mostly in the medical business and, and things like that. And then after that, I actually uh, became a consultant. I started my own consulting business in Seattle. Um, so, and I can, I had that for about 24 years in Seattle. And what we did essentially was we worked with uh, sales teams negotiating everything from simple products to very complex products. And I, I, I spent a lot of time teaching the principles from the book, getting to yes, negotiating agreement with, without getting in, which was a book written by William Urey and Roger Fisher out of Harvard. And I had worked with them in teaching those principles to corporations. So, so I did that for a number of years and, and then just, I don't want to go too deeply into it, but I got involved with one specific company that was very on the very cutting edge of medical devices and they hired me directly to run their sales team. Mm -hmm. So it was new technology. We rolled it out in the U S and I was part of that. Then we rolled it out in Europe and I was part of that. And then we rolled it out in, in Asia. It was my job to lead the growth in Asia. So I found myself using all the sales principles, all the negotiation principles, and all the leadership principles with a with a very large sales organization in Asia. Um, and that's why I'm, that's when I moved to Thailand in 2018, 2019. My boss asked me, said, "Can you come to Asia and do that?" So I had kind of left my consulting you know, career behind and my book writing behind. And I, and I took on this job of actually applying all those principles for real life in, in, in the world. <clears throat> and I did quite well. Our company did exceptionally well in the three markets that I helped organize and uh, recruit the sales team. Um, and then when they moved me to Asia, they said, here, let's get things going in Asia. <clears throat> this was in 2019. And I was on an airplane every week flying to all different cities giving presentations to hospital administrators and ministers of health governments and like Myanmar and 
uh, India. I've been to India multiple times, uh, Australia, places like that, Japan, China, all that. Um, and then COVID hit. And I couldn't, I could no longer do my job because my job was kind of face to face interacting with these people. So my company said to me, well, let's move you back to the U.S. And I said, thank you very much, but I think I'll stay here. So, uh, so I had to. I, I ended up I ended up negotiating a retirement agreement with them, which was very, very, as you can imagine, was very, very good for my interests. And then since then, I've been uh, that was 2021 when I negotiated the agreement and formally retired from the company. And since then, I've been doing consulting mostly through um, uh, financial organizations like investment houses and things like that who want to invest in the business I, I was in which was infectious disease. So it's quite a change from my, my consulting around negotiating and selling the leadership. But, uh, but it was fun because the end of my career was really one about applying all the principles that I had written about in real time, on the ground, making decisions in the field, large financial and uh, strategic decisions, and using those to make sure that they actually work. So it was really great. Mm-hmm. And that's where I say I'm retired, semi-retired yeah. in Thailand, um, writing, uh, reading and surfing. <laughs> okay, writing, reading, and surfing. That's awesome. Yeah, Steve, I, I totally, um, you know, I can't say that I don't envy you because Thailand is one of those countries that uh, is probably equivalent to Florida in the U.S., where everybody <laughs> goes down south to retire. But yeah, yeah uh, you, you have really wonderful weather all all year round in Thailand. So I'm sure you must be really enjoying your semi-retirement. Now, uh, and, and the food is great as well. The food is oh, great the food as well. Is great as well. <laughs> Okay. All right. Okay. Awesome. Okay. So, uh, so Steve, um, uh, you know, it's interesting that you mentioned that you were in the FBI because I actually mm-hmm. did not uh, know that. Um, no. You also happen to know about uh, this particular book right here by Chris Voss, Never Split the Difference. He was also mm-hmm. uh, an FBI consultant, as far as I know. And uh, yep. uh, would you happen to know him personally as well, or? No. Uh, and. and- my career at the FBI was quite short. I kind of throw that in as kind of an interesting thing, but I lived in Washington yeah. for two years and I was in forensic. So it's fingerprints, blood analysis. And this was back, back in the 1970s when things were very rudimentary. Really? So, and I was only there for two years and then I went to graduate school. So yeah. okay. really I FBI career, I only use it as a, a way to uh, get people's attention when they go, Oh, have you had any interesting jobs? And I go, yeah, I used to work for the FBI. And that typically <laughs> They go, what? Um, so so that's what I use it. But no, I, I do. I, but I am familiar with that book, Never Split the Difference. Mm-hmm. Okay, understood. Well, um, so uh, so coming back to uh, your book, uh, uh, Negotiating with Tough Customers, what was the reason that you uh, that you had written the book? Uh, you, you, you alluded to the book, uh, Getting to Yes, written yes. by William Yuri and Roger Fisher. And yes. so I got, and I, I admittedly, I haven't finished reading this book yet, but I got enough of uh, uh, the gist of this particular book by reading your book, uh, which yeah. shows that, uh, you know, this particular book is trying to say something, but then you have a contrarian truth to present to the world. So uh, yeah. would you tell us a little bit more about, uh, you know, the raison death of the book? Why did you write the book in the first place? So the book Getting to Yes is the fifth best selling business book of all time. Right. And technically, if you read part of it, it's not really a business book. I mean, it has business. The very few business examples, they're more personal examples about renting a house or renting things like that. And and so so that so and it's the number one negotiating book by a long time. I mean, it's just one of the most popular books. And in trying to implement it with large, complex, very critical negotiations, I found that. If you come up against someone who has a lot invested, it's very difficult to implement those principles. I mean, the book Getting to Yes comes from the perspective that people are basically good and they will, you can eventually get them to play win win. That's not been my experience. There are people and there are organizations and and strictly, and there are, I think there are some cultures that are more focused on bargaining than like principled negotiation, which was Richard Jury. So I found myself trying to apply these principles um, and finding that they came up very short. So I kind of went to school with the best negotiators. And in the book, we talk about hospital contract and we talk about working with Caterpillar tractor, negotiating mining trucks and stuff like that. And I looked and said, what are these guys doing that are really working 
for them because they were reaching good deals, but they weren't reaching win-win. Now, the win-win proposition is, you know, you focus on interests, you have discussions, and hopefully you reach an agreement. Um, in hardball negotiating, oftentimes it's your ability to take a punch, get back up and punch back is really what makes you successful. So, and there weren't really any books out there that addressed this as a contrast to uh, the win-win approach. There were ones out there that talked about negotiating, but no one, not once that came up against the win-win and said, here's an alternative. Now, I certainly, if a person plays win-win and you have a long, good relationship with them and a good strategic relationship for your company, then the principles of getting to yes apply absolutely, especially if you need each Right. If, if, for instance, Boeing has some suppliers that they are single source, so they need each other. They have to play win win. If they play hardball, neither of them can walk away from the negotiating table or they can't produce a triple seven or they can't produce, a, you know, a, 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 a 787. But in many negotiations, it's not that way. And so I saw this sort of need and I saw these skill sets and they began to organize in my mind. And I've written many, many books, as you have come to know, that take what looks like a ambiguous sort of fluid process and breaks it into a set of steps. So that's what I did with this book, which was, you know, the uh, negotiating with tough customers. It's okay, how can I do this in a way that I take these skills that I'm seeing and I'm also using in the field every day and be able to bake those into a set of logical steps, much like Yuri and Fisher does in their book. I mean, they have five principles of uh, five five strategies for principle negotiation. You know, so I have three phases of a negotiation, and each one of those phases has four principles. So it's sort of the same way. But my mind's very good. Probably get this from my father. Mine's very good at taking complex subjects and and simplifying them into a process. And then once I was doing that. Because I was on airplanes so much, I started writing. And then from that writing came a book. And then from the book, I submitted to the publisher. And they said, yes, we'd love to have this book. So so that's that's how it came about. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. And I think that a, a lot of us who have read the book, uh, myself included, are extremely thrilled to that you did uh, go through that uh, you know process of writing it. But that, comes, that actually leads up to my next question, Steve, that... Mm -hmm. uh, uh, tell us a little bit more about the writing process itself. Uh, so you've alluded to the fact that you wrote it in between your travels going, you know, plane hopping and country hopping. Uh, but was it an easy writing process or did you find it a very daunting task to write the book? Itself? Well, this, was, this was my fifth book. So my very first book was a parenting book. And when I first wrote that book, I sent the manuscript to an editor and they sent it back to me saying, you can't write. Um, you're not you're not a good writer. So I was like, OK, how do I figure this out? So I hired a writing coach. I actually hired a writing coach and rewrote that book about six or seven times. So I had the process down of of of. OK, so here is here's here's there's a couple of things with writing. One that's really important I pay attention to is what's called flow. It said, does it have a logical flow? In fact, that's one of the one of the problems I found with other negotiating books, not the getting the yes book, but other negotiating book is there's no flow to it. It's like, here's a tip, here's a tip, here's a tip, here's a tip, where for me, it's like, okay, I'm going to start at the beginning and work all the way through this process. And I, I've done that with my selling book. I've done that with my parenting book. I've done that with my negotiating book um, and things like that. So, so I've been able to do that. So writing it down in sections, right. And then creating a flow to it was really the key. And I really found that each once I had the basic structure of the book together, that things just fell into their allotted slots. And and the book, I hate to say it wrote itself because that, that may, makes it seem like it's not a painful process. But if you've ever written a book, you know, you have to submit it to a content editor, which reviews the content, comes back to you and tells you you've got to change this. A text editor that looks at all the, your sentence structure, a grammar editor and things like that. So so it's a process of back and forth quite a bit. But the original manuscript probably took me three months to write when that's it. Whereas my parenting book took me about a year and a half. So you get it down to the point where, you know, OK, once I have my buckets of information, I just kind of start throwing those in. Mm -hmm. Okay. All right. So three months. So uh, yeah, that, that's really um, a good timeline. Okay. Um, yeah. So 
Uh, okay, so Steve, uh, now getting into the the nitty gritty of the book itself. Um, you yeah. Know, as, I, as I alluded to in the beginning of our uh, discussion, that uh, I believe that the book is actually a contrarian truth to getting to yes. And mm -hmm. we also touched a little bit about uh, Chris Voss's book, uh, Never Split the Difference. So what makes negotiating with tough customers different from yeah. other negotiation books that are out there? If you were to give people a reason to pick up the book, what would be that one particular reason? So the key differentiator, I think, is, is is the is the concept in the book, which I think is profound when it comes to negotiating, but that I've never seen in any other book. And if you read it, you know you'll know what I'm talking about. Is the difference from one negotiation to another? Um, many, many, actually, almost all negotiating books, including Getting Yes, they believe that if you've seen one negotiation, you've seen them all. So they kind of provide tips and techniques and things like that that may work in simple transactional negotiations. But when it gets into a complex negotiation, they, they're they often perceived as being amateurish. So, so to further clarify on that, the thing that most differentiates one negotiation from another is not the person negotiating. It's not the product. It's not the price. It's not how much is on the table. It's complexity. Right. And complexity is if I'm going into negotiate, negotiate a car, I'm negotiating maybe the price, maybe some extras, things like that. I can complete that negotiation in a couple hours. And maybe some of those tips from negotiating books will work. But if I'm negotiating a hospital contract or a major elevator you know, contract that has multiple terms and conditions, financing, all that, that is a strategic negotiation. And that's the key difference is a complex negotiation needs a strategic approach. Um, a simple negotiation are tactics, tips, things like that. But when you think about it, really the key differentiator, and one I've never seen in any negotiation book I've ever read. Now, granted, I haven't read a negotiating book in the last five years, but before that, I think I read everything on the market. Never seen that explained. And there's two reasons for that. One is probably it never occurred to anyone that that it could be the main differentiator. And the other is, if you sell a book on negotiation and consider every negotiation the same, then you sell more books, right? <laughs> so so if if I, my book, I don't think, is for people who do simple negotiations. My book is for people who do complex, multi-influence or multi-level multi -multi -level selling that have lots of terms and conditions. I mean, I, I talk a little bit, and you're familiar with hospital contracts in the U.S., hospital insurance contracts. They can have up to 40,000 line items. You know? And hospital insurers have entire organizations. All they do is run modeling to figure out if we cut in one area, where do we have to make it up in the other? So those negotiations can take a year and a half to come finish. They can have as many 30 counter offers, right? Wow. So, you know, so with that, that's complex. And if you take a very simple book, even if you take getting to yes and you try to apply it to those negotiations, there may be some tips that you can get for those books, you know, but when it comes to complex negotiations that take lots of times of counter offers, you need a strategy or, or, or you will lose. You will lose. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. So I think that, that's the main difference. For sure. For sure. And I, and Steve, I think I, that, uh, did you find that comes across in the book that I, that I communicated that? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, uh, honestly speaking, Steve, like uh, when, it, when you mentioned that, there is a difference between simple negotiation and complex negotiation. It all depends on the complexity of the product. I was completely yeah. sold on the book right then and there. I was like, you know, I have to have this book because it's so relevant to my particular industry where, where as you mentioned, that I work with the elevators and escalators where there's so many different items uh, in play. And uh, when you gave the example in the book about, um, you know, hospital contract negotiations, with you know more than 30 50 or 100 items in play i was like wow and i thought i was in a tough industry but this seems like something completely on another level so um you know do tell us a little bit more about that steve for those of us uh, who haven't actually read the book yet um uh, yeah. tell us what a typical hospital contract negotiation would look like that what that's like okay so a couple of things to understand so hospital contracts the hospitals contract with insurance companies for payment reimbursement for doing if you go in and you get a tonsils removed there's a price for that and things like that so so 
when you think about it, a large hospital can have as much as $300 million in what's called spend with an insurer. So there's $300 million on the table for a one-year contract, right? And um, what that means is the hospital is trying to figure out how they can make money and the insurance company is trying to figure out how they make money. So they engage in a process that's very, uh, I would say, predictable at the beginning. Predictable meaning, okay, we're going to sit down and one contract's coming to the end of the, it's called a term, term is when it's finished, and we need to negotiate for the following year. And they'll begin to do analysis, economic analysis of how much was spent for this procedure, how much was spent for that procedure, how much are you spending, how much are you um, paying your competition? We'll talk about that a little bit more. How much if you're if you're if you're paying your competitor uh, insurance company more than we should get more and things like that. So there's a lot of, I would say, pre-negotiating that, that goes into it. And then they ended up sitting at a big table and that's for the initial kickoff and they basically my point in my coaching with them don't put a number on the table right mm -hmm. just feel them out try and leave the first meeting understanding how far apart you are don't try to come to an agreement understand how far apart you are uh, because and that's you know it, it can become a bit of a game you can ask the hospital so how much do you want and they go i'm not sure how much are you offering and then, my always joke was say, well, we asked you first, right? So, uh, which didn't always go over well, but it broke the ice sometimes. But they're trying to figure out how far apart they are. It, hospitals always want an increase in reimbursement. Insurance companies always want a decrease. And they can be $70 million apart as far away as that is concerned. So they're going to work it out over the months by coming back and forth with counter offers and proposals and things like that, where they're going to come to. And then they'll eventually reach what I call a mutually disagreeable agreement. That's at least one year in length. Mm -hmm. So, but keep in mind, the hospitals have departments that run modeling software, pricing modeling software. And so do, so do the uh, insurance companies. So there's a lot of that. We have to get back to you. And then they go back and they do the models and they come out and go, OK, well, now for premature babies, what's called NICU, we can't give them any more than a 10 percent increase. Mm -hmm. And the hospital said, no, 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 we want a 20 percent increase. And we're like, no, 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 we would 10 percent, but maybe we'll go 12 percent if over here for hips, you know, you can reduce that by 3 percent. So there's lots of horse trading, for lack of a better term, but that goes on in that contract and almost every move in one area affects the other area right and a similar kind of getting more to your industry like with caterpillar right negotiating for mining trucks and things like that there's aftermarket service there's uh support personnel there's the degree to which they get training and development over the life of the of the machine and things like that and all those things are what i call put in play in fact that's Definitely, I'm not sure if I mentioned that, but that's that's the definition of complexity is the number of items that are in play. Yeah, yeah, yep, yep, absolutely, absolutely. And I just couldn't agree more. Now, uh, Steve, uh, coming back to uh, the hospital contract negotiation, there is one, uh, mm -hmm. uh, you know, uh, one small question that I had, which I wasn't completely uh, sure about in the book, but now that I have have you right in front of me, I have an opportunity to ask. Um, while the hospital is negotiating with your uh, company, uh, you know, that's a one-to-one mm -hmm. -one negotiation. But right. at the same time, uh, was the hospital also having parallel uh, negotiations with other insurance companies as well? Or was it just a, you know, one-to-one -one negotiation with your particular company? Yeah, it's a good question. And, 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 and it's a thing particular to that industry. So, so a hospital will have multiple insurers, right? So while... One of the one of the insurers name is United Healthcare. That hospital will also have an agreement, a contract with Blue Cross Blue Shield, which is another. They could also have another one with Aetna. So there's multiple insurance companies. Now the difference there is for you, probably your customers buy they contract with one elevator company. Hospitals contract with multiple insurance companies. So that's a big difference. One of the reasons I did that, Omar, is because I wanted to keep it simple because I see selling as different from negotiating. And I thought about including some other more competitive examples, but I felt like the hospital contract really got into the nitty gritty of how do you hold your ground? How do you counter offer? How do you think things like that? Because if you get into the 
competitive world, it would make it a much longer book and more complex. But it, but it's a good question, and I, if 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 you want to go down that road, I have some uh, I think fairly good answers to that. Okay, that's that's awesome. Yeah, uh, maybe we can deep dive a little bit uh, uh, on this particular point. Like as you mentioned uh, just a couple of minutes back, uh, the relationship that Boeing has with its suppliers, where they kind of need each other because they don't actually have anybody else to go to, right? right. So, so you're kind of stuck with each other. But uh, yeah. in, uh, you know, in, and digressing a little bit in in our particular industry in the elevator market in Bangladesh. Um, it, it's the kind of market where which uh, which isn't really that uh, regulated heavily by the government. So you have yeah. uh, barriers to entry which are very low, and so you get every uh, you know you get the good companies like Otis, Schindler, uh, Kone, and Thiessen Group, Mitsubishi, etc. But you also get every Tom, Dick, and Harry you know just kind of yeah. uh, entering the industry, uh, and so they may not have the best safety record, etc. But they come with a really good price. And so, and so we kind of always find ourselves, you know, uh, the good companies are always up against the, 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 the mid-level companies who kind of uh, play off on the pricing part because that's their go-to strategy and they always try to undercut us. And so, uh, you know, so whenever we enter a negotiation with a customer, we know at the back of our minds that they are talking to 10 other suppliers as well. And so they will try and get one particular, uh, you know, uh, contract and uh, yeah. shared with the rest of us and say, hey, these guys are giving me this. What what can you give me? Can you match it, et cetera? And so they play off, play us all, play all of us off of each other, right? Yeah. So yeah. So that again, if I were to um, say that, okay, so with the imminent threat of competition, yeah. um, how will uh, the negotiation tactics uh, change, or will it change at all, or would you say that you know what, just concentrate on yourself and forget about the competition? So what would be your it's question. it's an excellent question, and 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 I really like that you asked this question because I make a big distinction in my book as well as when I work with organizations of the difference between negotiating and selling, and that's the challenge. I have yet to find a negotiating book that makes a clear di distinction between the two. They kind of think they're the same, but, but they're very very much interrelated. The better you are at selling, typically, the better you are at negotiating. The worse you are at selling, typically the worse you are at negotiating because there's only two ways to narrow the gap between the low price the customer wants to pay and the high price that you want to charge them. That is, either you prove to them that the value you bring is worth the difference or you 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 negotiate, bargain, whatever, till you reach some sort of midpoint. Both of them are key. That convincing them that you bring value is selling. Now, what is the definition of a value proposition? The definition of a value proposition is it is something that the customer values and is different from your competition. So your value proposition is not just something they value. It has to be something they value and are different from their competition. So, but, and I say in the book, people will say to me, Steve, I don't, my, I make a generic product. I have tons of competitors. And I said, okay, so how do you differentiate? Right? Because that's the key. And differentiation is um, it's not just the product. right? It, the product could be differentiated, but if the product isn't differentiated, maybe you differentiate the sales representation. Maybe you're an incredible sales rep. You're attentive. You've been in your territory for 10 years. You know your customers. You know what they want. That's worth something. Maybe your company differentiates through financing, through the fact that they uh, do co-marketing and things like that. Maybe so it's not just the product that's differentiated. So, so you try to differentiate. Now, coming to your industry, you know, you have the mom and pop companies that are out there and saying, "Oh, well, we can do the same thing at a cheaper price." Do they really do the same thing? Your customer has a relationship with the product with your company, with you, with your service and support organization, right? That's worth something to the customer. Now you, now the customers will play that down and say, I don't care, I just want the cheapest price. It's not really the case. What I found is the best salespeople, in, even in generic industries, get better deals than the bad salespeople, right? Because they're better at holding line for price. Keep in mind that if you're not differentiated, there, well, there are two ways to close that gap. One is differentiate yourself, right? And prove to them that you're worth the value. But if you're not differentiated, then you got to really get good at bargaining, right? Because 
because that's your other tool. So it's like, it's like, okay, so we have a generic product. So I'm going to go back in and I'm going to say, you know what, I'm going to give them a, a one and a half percent discount where I know my competition is coming in 2%. I'm going to give them a one and a half to discount, but let them know, Hey, here's what I'm offering, but I'm willing to negotiate further, right. To keep them in the game. So the thing is you, it's important to prove to them that you, to your customers, that you bring more value. And that's why I think salespeople, when they get tied up in that price game, hey, they're giving us a better price. They immediately kind of default to, I'll go talk to my manager, see if I can get the same price. The phrase I use all the time is, um, and I also tell my clients to use it, is this price is fair and reasonable. Let me tell you why. Right? Mm -hmm. Now, in letting me tell you why is so important, because if I give you a good story, it may not mean that I get the price I started with, but it means I get a better price than my competitor. Right. 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 Because I can tell that story. So it's not a lot of the negotiating books say, oh, make this argument and you'll be fine. It's like, no, no, no. Let's talk about it. Making the argument doesn't mean you get what you want. It means you get better than if you hadn't made the argument. Right. Mm -hmm. So coming back to your business, I mean, if you look at your business and everything your organization brings to the table as a salesperson you constantly have to be hitting the customer over the head with that right hey the, yes they're giving you the best price but how long have they been in the business but how many feet do they have on the street and services and sort but how much financing can they offer you but um now a good negotiator on the other side hardball would say i don't care about that i don't care about that. i don't care about that do they really not care about that or is that a bluff right mm -hmm. And the longer you know the customer, the more you've been in negotiation with customer is the only way to figure out is if it's a bluff or, you know, it's, 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 you have to know. That's the one thing about many of the industries like Caterpillar, they deal with the same customers over and over again, and they know when they're bluffing. Right. That's so, right. so. Important. Yeah. But yeah, when it comes to the competition, you, it's your job and you know, it's your company's job to figure out ways to differentiate. I mean, that's the game, right? Yeah. And if yeah. you can different, we'll say, I don't care about that. Take that with a grain of salt. They do care about it. It doesn't mean that you that you go down to the price that the competitors are offering, but you say, hey, well, what's that worth to you? Right? Mm -hmm. What does it worth to you that I've got that that my sales rep's been calling on you for 10 years, that we've serviced and supported you before? for X number of years. What's that worth to you? The fact that we have a reputation in the marketplace and, you know, we, we, we have stable financial, what's that worth to you? Right? Mm -hmm. It's worth something, but yeah. they don't think it's worth something to them. Mm -hmm. So it's, it's almost sort of like a, 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 almost a head game where you're saying this and they're going, I don't care. I don't care. I don't care. But reality, you have to think if they go with that supplier at that rock bottom price, is that really a good decision for their company? So, mm -hmm. right, it's 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 competitive. I mean, it's competitive, but but I find salespeople they capitulate to bargaining before they stop selling, or they stop selling, capitulate to bargain. Customer says, "Well, you got to reduce your price twenty percent." Well, my response is, "No, no, no, no. Let me let me tell you why our price is there because it's fair and reasonable when you figure out everything you're getting for this price." Mm -hmm. And so many salespeople don't have that conversation. Yeah, that's right. That's right. And, and I think you put it quite succinctly, Steve, that, uh, you know, telling the customer why your product is worth more and why the price is fair. Uh, you know, I've, I've had the opportunity to put that into practice that I can I can say rest assured that, yeah, it is something that really works uh, well. Now, um, I'll just digress a little bit, Steve, and uh, yeah. and just uh, tell you a little bit uh, something a little bit more about this uh, particular industry I'm in. Um, uh, I think that a lot of the times, and this is just knowledge sharing, you know, I'm, I'm, yeah, yeah. you might find it a bit interesting as well. Uh, I think a lot of the times, whenever we segment our customers, uh, so we've got the real estate developers who are uh, one segment, we've got the individuals who actually build their own house with their own money, you know, self-finance, we call them private customers. And mm -hmm. then the third list of customers are basically uh, factories, you know, factories who, um, you, who probably have an RNG factory or, a you know a, anything related to the garments industry as you know that Bangladesh yeah. is pretty well known for garments so we we kind of go after the segment that we know that we have a better chance of winning like uh, yeah. for example the real estate developers uh, depending on their you know classification if they're an A grade supply uh, you know developer uh, they will always try and give something that's you know uh, of a reasonably good quality 
but uh, but the private individuals you know, a lot of uh, other companies know that these are just one time sales and so they try yeah. you know sell them once and then they don't even have to think about them so they kind of are the ones who fall into the trap of of going for the lowest price uh, yeah you know, elevator in the market but but the factories, uh, they because they they'll, they'll not just have one factory, but they'll probably expand into several factories. Yeah, yeah. They will never take a chance with a rinky dinky company. They will have probably yeah. preferably go for uh, something that's within their budget, but at the same time they also want to ensure the quality. So I this particular segment is one where I really feel that uh, you, you have a lot of opportunity to negotiate. Uh, you know, uh, and uh, <laughs> so, so yeah, I just thought I'd share that. But I think that this also, um, you know, leads up into my next question, which is, which I think is probably something I probably should have asked you uh, around the beginning of the interview, but let me just ask it now. Um, what is your definition of negotiating or negotiation? How would you define it? Yeah. Yeah. Uh, so it's, I do address that in the book because there's so many complex, there's so many complex um, definition of negotiation. You know, uh, Yuri's negotiation definition, if I recall, I want to quote it almost uh, succinctly and clearly. Negotiation is back and forth communication to reach agreement when some interests are shared and some interests are opposed. I think that's the true definition. Well, I mean, that's okay. So that's a working definition, I guess, for some. It's not what I would say. For me, you know, the, the, the definition of, for me in negotiation is is um, contained in my distinction between selling and negotiating. You know, um, there's only two ways to close the gap between the high price a customer wants to pay and, or the low price a customer wants to pay and the high price. And that is you either convince them that the price difference, that you bring enough value that the price difference is worth it, that's called selling, right? Or you go back and forth until you reach agreement, which is called negotiating. So negotiations don't begin really until numbers are on the table, right? You know how far apart you are. Not They don't have to literally be on the table, so you know how far apart you are. All of them before that, people could call that negotiation, but when it comes to like, okay, you can do some pre-negotiation, what I would call... Um, reconnaissance right but negotiation doesn't really stop and they go okay give me a price that's the beginning that's what i call negotiating right give me a price now before that is so critical that's where you that's where you make your differentiation right things like that and it could be and if you talk about these suppliers or the the the, um, the elevator suppliers to factories being such and the factory market being such a large one important one for you that relationship between your sales organization and the buying organization or that the entire organization is crucial because they will share information that you get a feel for what, how they're going to approach these negotiations, stuff like that. But I don't see that as negotiation. I see negotiation as, okay, here we are. Now we have to narrow the gap between the two. That That's what I call negotiation. Yuri calls that bargaining. Mm-hmm. I think it's semantics. Um, and, and he doesn't also, most of his, most of the, the getting GS does not apply to the sales industry. And I, I want to talk about one thing specific, how that does not apply to the sales industry when we get to that. But when it comes to this, I think being able to um, everything before is, that is positioning and selling value. And then once you're out of the gate, that's how I define negotiating. In fact, I say in the book, negotiations begin, you know, with first offers, right? So that's that's the beginning of negotiation, and the end of the negotiation is best and final offer. So, so and uh, and while if you walk into a car dealership, the first offer and best and final offer happens in one hour, maybe even maybe even maybe a little bit more than that. When I come back to either Caterpillar tractor or hospital contract, first offer is made, and the final offer is not made until six or nine months later. So mm-hmm. um, that's true complex negotiation. Mm-hmm. Absolutely. So, uh, Steve. Uh, uh, here's a, a question that uh, I had, which was, um, can you give us an example? You've talked about the hospital negotiations, but can you give us an example from, uh, you know, empirical example of a negotiation that really went well for you and one that really went sour uh, from from your, you know, work history? Yeah, yeah. yes. So the last industry I was in was infectious disease, right? And infectious disease, I was with a company um, I was in charge of global training and business development for this company. And it was a proprietary technology, very, very uh, uh, complex. 
and it was for infectious disease testing. So, you know, before COVID. So, and it was, it was very, very complex. And, and typically you would go into a hospital, make a presentation and the way they were currently doing it, hospitals were currently doing it would, would take them three days to get an answer. This technology applied. I'm sorry, let me go back three days to get an answer. It was maybe 60 to 70% accurate. This test one hour, 99.2% accurate. So I would go in and I would often say, okay, I would do the presentation and minister of health or the head of the hospital would say, this is amazing. We love it. How much is it? And I would tell them, they go, well, not at that price. And, uh, and typically I would say, well, Actually, it's a fair and reasonable price. And let me tell you why, which is my, which is my. And then I had a whole presentation building up to how much they were spending on treating the patient and drugs they were giving the patient for three days while they waited and things like that. Very powerful presentation. So, um, so I came up against uh, a major hospital in New York City, and I will remain nameless, but a major hospital in New York City who wanted the technology really, really badly. And they saw the value of it, but were really hardball negotiators. And um, and we went in to we had gone back and forth and it was a big enough hospital that they wanted the machines, which were were processing machines for free. And they wanted to just pay for the test. And we said, no, 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 you can't you can't do that. You know, it's the machines You have to pay for the machines up front because we have to make some money off that. And we were a fairly young company, so we weren't making so. And 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 they say to they said to us um, at one point, they said, hey, listen. This is an untested technology, and you're asking us to take a te- take a risk on this. And um, and we see that because we are such an important name in um, in the in the in the medical field, in the hospital field in New York City, you should give us these things for free. So we took a sidebar, took a time out, and said, "Come on, let's let's go out. What do we do?" And we were hemming and hauling and stuff like that. And we back in. We went back in. And we said, "Listen." This technology is going to change the way hospitals work. And we're giving you an opportunity to get in on the ground floor. If you don't want to take this opportunity, that's fine. We'll go someplace else. But if you want to take this opportunity, we're not saying you'll pay full price for the machines. We'll negotiate a deal. But we're not going to give you the technology for free. There's just the demand is too high. Even though it's risky, we see the future. This is the future. And we said, thank you very much. If you change your mind, give us a call. And we laughed. And uh, and and the company was like, I can't believe we just walked out of that hospital. We just cannot believe we walked out of the hospital. Um, they called us back within a week, said, come on back in. Let's have a let's have a conversation. So we knew we were in the driver's seat, right? When we walked, because they called us back in. Because when they call you back in, it's like, you know, they they showed their hands. We they need us back in. But they were and, and, the, and the company was like, well, let's go in and let's like, let's drive a hard bargain. Let's take everything off the table that we had before. Let's go. We have these guys. And I said, no, 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 no. I said, let's let's approach this in a way where we can be fair and reasonable with them. So we went in and we did a deal. We negotiated and we gave them a significant discount. But we tied that to usage of the and also we tied that to um um, um, key opinion leaders that were working at the hospital would come out and speak for us and all the other major hospitals. So it turned into, we gave up maybe $1.2 million in upfront revenue. We probably gained 20 to 30 million in revenue based on their key opinion leaders and the fact that they use it. So that it was an example of if you, I, we, if we played hardball, we wouldn't have gotten everything we wanted, but we had to play hardball at the beginning because um, if we gave in, we would have set a precedent that the instruments, the, mecha- the, the, the capital equipment would be given away for free. And we just did not want to do that with how young a company we were and the fact that, you know, we we had to make that money to pay payroll and things like that. So that was that was a good one. Uh, so that was good. so. Um, but it's an example of having, you know, you have a breakthrough technology, you have a lot of power, you have a lot. I mean, we everyone believed in it. And I felt, well, it has played out because PCR technology is you're probably familiar with PCR technology. This was the beginning of PCR. And um, it played out that we were right, that this is where the market was going to go. But even then, with all the power, we didn't play hardball. 
right? Mm -hmm. But we held our ground, but we didn't play hardball. We went back in and said, okay, let's work out a deal to both our best interests and let's see if we can do it. So we actually, on the back end, we brought in what I would say were win-win principles, but in the front end, we played the hardball. And that's an important point point in that if you begin with win-win against hardball people, it's hard to regain that ground. But if you start with hardball, it's much easier to go to win-win. And that's why when I'm with reps and the salespeople and they begin off, oh, we can do whatever you want. I'm like, that's the wrong thing. That's <laughs> <laughs> yeah. and, the, and the bad negotiation, I mean, the one that, that went south, I, I, really the, the most, the best one would be um, when I was, when I went to, and I think this negotiation is the book, when I had a company that wanted to purchase the rights to a, to a, a seminar that I had developed on my book, um, um negotiating with tough customers and it was another training company which well so a name and i was in the meeting with the ceo and um and and uh, it was uh, i won't forget it it, it was in it was in the, uh, the hartford connecticut area in the u.s it was cold and it was sunny and we were in his office and he was just he kept saying the phrase over and over again well negotiation programs are a dime a dozen and i kept saying excuse me with all due respect, let let me tell you how this is different. Mm -hmm. And I would tell him and he would say, okay, Steve, Steve, I got it, but they're all, and I said, I have to tell you, I don't agree with you. And, and, and I, I think I've made the argument that, you know, this negotiations are, um, my approach to negotiations is exactly what I think the market needs now because the NTY approach has become saturated and sales managers are going, I got people playing win-win with hardball customers are giving away the store. So, so coming up against this guy was, was tough. And then he made a statement that was stupid. I mean, with all due respect, that was stupid. He said, Steve, I have to let you know, we are in the game with another negotiating seminar company. And they've told us, they'll do anything to get the business. And I said, they've told you they'd do anything to get the business and you think they're going to be good at teaching people to go to negotiate. And he looked in and go, Oh, right. I said, thank you very much. If, if you want to do a deal, I'm welcome to do a deal, but I'm not going to match the price of this competitor you're talking about. Cause that would do, it would be the wrong way to negotiate. And I walked out. So, so that deal did not come. And actually, it probably would have been a huge money maker because this company is a really large training company, one of the one of the best known in the U.S. and and I really wanted that business. But the fact that the CEO was playing hardball with me, but did not understand his own interests, um, was one where I just felt as though <laughs> I felt as though if I took the, if I if I matched the price of his competitors, I'd be selling my soul. Hmm. Okay. <laughs> well, uh, that's a really <laughs> apt way of putting it. So, Steve, thank you so much for sharing these two stories, because I, I think that, you know, empirical evidence and, you know, uh, life experiences and an opportunity to share it with our viewers and listeners, you know, that is that is something that I really treasure. I'm sure that anybody who is watching or listening to this podcast will have benefited greatly from Uh, these two contrasting stories. Now, uh, so Steve, moving on to uh, the next segment of uh, our um, episode, Uh, we're coming up to the last quarter of our hour. And so we Mm -hmm. have a couple of staple questions which we usually ask all of our guests. So uh, the first question that I have is that uh, because we are a book related uh, podcast, I need to ask you about some of your uh, favorite uh, books and what kind of genre of books you enjoy reading. Are you more of a fiction guy or a non-fiction guy so what do you like to read what does Steve so like? yeah and I'm pretty straightforward I like science fiction and non-fiction science like, fiction and non-fiction oh wow yeah. so for would that reason, happen to be uh Star Wars some, or Star Trek by any chance oh, sorry come again reason fiction has never floated my boats oh, I mean I've, I've read some good fiction you know when I was younger I used to you know my father always said I I I uh I devoured books because I was really a, a big reader, um, you know, when I was in when I was in college and after college. And I think I went through a period of reading every business book that was available and stuff like that. So I read a lot. But, yeah, right now I've kind of settled into a nonfiction and, and a fiction, uh, nonfiction and science fiction mm-hmm. uh, genre. 
nonfiction and science fiction. So, um, so uh, if I were to deep dive a little bit into the science fiction aspect, would you happen to be a Star Trek fan or a Star Wars fan or anything like that or something different? Well, certainly the Star Wars movies were fun, you know, at least the good ones. Um, but, but, but when it comes to um, science fiction, you know, the, some of the old school science fiction, the Dune trilogies and Isaac Asimov and stuff like that. But most recently, I just finished reading a uh, Hail Mary by Andy Weir. Okay. He wrote The Martian, which was made into a movie. Mm -hmm. And they're going to make Hail Mary into a movie. It's a very fascinating uh, science fiction book about, uh, about well, Andy Weir, he wrote The Martian. And he is the one that kind of like he's I think he's a he was a, an engineer, mm -hmm. but he's also a writer. So what I like is he and now analyzes things from a very technical perspective and how would a person survive in this situation? So. So I'm, I'm reading that and that's and that's uh, that's a good book. So I, I, I do recommend both those books, The Martian and Hail Mary. Um, and on the nonfiction right book, I'm reading The Great Big Book of Horrible Things by Matthew White. Oh, so wow. that's quite the tongue twister. Yeah. So what, the, what's it about? Yeah, it's tell, the tell. hundred uh, horrible things that ever happened in the world. So it gives a background on Stalin. Oh. Uh, uh, the Mayans, um, Christopher Columbus, and just all the all the things that have done that, that have that uh, the the rise in India and, and the starvation. Mm -hmm. So, I like to be a realist in life. So I I like to believe in like like humanity is a force for good. But I think one of the things for me is remembering how bad we've been. So going back and looking at those things and realizing, God, we've come a long way. You know, from mm -hmm. when we were slaughtering hundreds of thousands of people in an afternoon right mm -hmm. so we've, so 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 that's 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 what i read and and there's lots of other nonfiction books i've read rachel i forget the last name rachel but she writes about the human body and uh the nose and uh, all this sort of stuff and the alimentary canal and i forget her name but but anyway that sort of thing so Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Yeah. Well, I, I uh, you know, I, I love the titles of the books that you just mentioned. So I'm definitely going to put those on my reading list. And I yeah, hope that yeah, anybody yeah. else who's watching and listening to this does likewise. So uh, the next question, Steve, is, uh, you know, it, it's something that I love to ask all of my guests. Um, but, uh, you know, feel free to uh, take your time to answer this one. If you could recommend a book that you feel that every, let's say, young person should read, uh, doesn't have to be related to sales or negotiation, but anything at all. Uh, what would be that book that you would recommend that everybody should read at least once in their lifetime? Yeah, yeah I would go. I would go with a book that's fairly well known globally, and 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 I knew the author uh, Stephen Covey, The Seven Habits of Highly Effective People. I just find if for a young person who wants to enter the business world, it's really really, I think, a good way to approach it. Now, Covey wasn't a business person. He had his own training company, but but he really hit the nail on some things. And when I get frustrated working with people, it often comes back to one of those, you know, seven habits they're not, you know, executing on. I mean, just like, just simple as simple as be concerned about what other people are, uh, you know, start, start with the other person in mind. I mean, just as simple as being on time for meetings, you know, showing up to the customer when you say, well, stuff like that. Those were sticklers I always had for myself in my career. So I, I think there's lots of things in there that if you if you live by those seven principles, I think it makes things a lot easier. So so that's 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 what I especially for young people. Mm -hmm. I would say. And, I, and I would also recommend um, getting to yes, negotiating with Greenman. Yeah, I, that's I, there's a reason it's one of the best sellers. Yeah. Um, very readable, and you don't have to be a business person to get something out of it. But I would also I would also say uh, uh, negotiating with tough customers right up there with that book as well. So. <laughs> <laughs> absolutely, yeah, absolutely. So the seven habits of highly effective people by Stephen Covey, uh, getting to yes, as well as your own book. So yeah, I, I think those are really good choices. I throw one more in if you want. Sure, sure, one. please go ahead. Yeah, my very first book was a parenting book. And it did really, really well. It's called Raising Alex, Teaching a Child to Make Smart Choices. Right. Mm -hmm. So I wrote this when my daughter, Alex, was seven years old. Mm -hmm. And it was my very first book. And, of course, I told you about the editing process. But 
she's a 32 year old, very successful, grown up, mature, emotionally secure, financially secure woman. And I think a lot of it had comes back to the decisions I made as a parent for her. And uh, I would recommend anyone who is a parent or, 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 it's thinking about becoming a parent to actually read that. It's actually not for parent. It's not an infant book. It's for kids around three to four years old. So, but, but that's the other book I would recommend. Oh, fab, fabulous. Fabulous. Thank you so much for uh, recommending that. And uh, we'll definitely have that in the description as well. Uh, yep. So that it will be easier for people to find it. Now, Steve, uh, we're right at the cusp of ending this episode, but before we let you go, you know, uh, do please tell us a little bit more about uh, any future or current writing project that you have? Are, do you have any books in the pipeline or anything at all that you're working on with regards to your uh, seminars, et cetera? Anything at all that you'd like to share? Or put in so a to tell you the truth, I'm, I'm pretty retired. Uh, I mean, I, I'm, I'm, I took up surfing at the age of 63 oh. and I'm lucky and I've gotten oh. failed. So surfing, the thing about retirement in Thailand, it's really nice. The food is good. The weather's good. The surf is good. I play pool at night in in the bars. So uh, so life is, is very nice. I have a, a whole collection of friends over here. Now, I do some writing. I do some consulting with those, with those um, uh, investment firms and things like that. And I have – right now, I have a number of companies, because they're coming out of COVID – they didn't really talk to me for two and a half years because I had just left a company, but, um, and there's sort of a, a statute of limitations there. So they're coming back to me and asking of me if I can give some advice on moving their companies into Asia. So I'll probably move into that in the next couple, in the next couple of uh, months and things like that. Writing. I, I don't have any real book in the pipeline. If people go to Amazon and search my name, Steve Riley, they'll see all my books. I think there's six or seven in there. And, uh, and I'm, I'm, I think I've had, I've said everything I want to say on paper at least. Uh, so, uh, awesome. so yeah. Enjoying. But this was really enjoyable um, as far as talking with you, Omar. And thanks for finding me and reaching out. And, and thanks for, thanks for the many compliments you give me on the book. It's, it's wonderful to hear that. I, I think in, you know, one one of the things that 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 if you got to know me, you'll know that I that sometimes I should say things that sound conceited, but um, I think it's one of the best negotiation books ever written because it has such a different take on negotiating. Um, and I think win win technique is good, but if you play win win, you will lose against a hardball negotiator. You just will, and I've seen it over and over again. So, uh, so I think it has a place. I might spend more time promoting it. I mean, you've kind of got some wind underneath my sails now. You see me posting some things on LinkedIn from the book, and uh, and I might I might do a little bit more of that. But if it takes away from my surfing, I won't put much time into it. <laughs> well, uh, yeah, I, I mean, yeah, I, I fully agree with you on that, Steve. That this is probably the best negotiation book I've ever read, and I not that I've read a lot, but. Uh, a lot of negotiation books, but yeah, this is completely, definitely right up there. And no, not at all. You don't sound conceited at all. I think that credit uh, should be given where credit is due. And that mm -hmm. is one of the reasons why I was so thrilled to be able to have the opportunity to talk to you because uh, it is uh, one of those, you know, uh, you know, uh, hidden treasures or hidden gems that everybody in the world should be talking about, especially those in, in our industry who work with uh, complex products, et cetera. Now, uh, you, you, you did mention LinkedIn, Steve. So I know that you're quite active on LinkedIn, but I gotta tell you that there's so many Steve Riley's out there that I did have a bit of a tough time trying to find the correct Steve Riley, but I'm so glad that uh, I managed to find you. But uh, uh, you know, uh, leading up to my last question, Steve, um, if your fans uh, and uh, readers wanted to get in touch with you, uh, what would be the best way to, you know, do so? Uh, you know, I would say LinkedIn, or they can send me a direct email, and and you could include that if it's Stephen Joseph Riley at gmail dot com. They can c contact me directly through that. I wouldn't give my Thai phone number. I, I don't know, you know, uh, I'd be thrilled to have twenty calls a day, but but it would interfere with my surfing. So uh, so best best if they could send an email. So if you include the email on it, that would be wonderful. Probably the email not through LinkedIn, email direct. I, I, I love to talk with, I have, I have, I still have people who send me emails about my parenting book and that, that was published more than 20 years ago. So I have people saying, Oh, I, did, I remember the story and my kid is doing great now and things like that. So, so that would be great. 
Mm-hmm. Absolutely. So Stephen Joseph Riley, right? That that that's Stephen Joseph Riley, and but it, it's spelled a certain way. So uh, when you put it on there, it'll be spelled correctly because it's Stephen with the PH and Riley spelled differently than most people spell it. So. Mm-hmm. Absolutely. Well, uh, Steve, thank you so much once again for making the time to uh, talk to me. Uh, and I really had a wonderful time uh, talking about the book and you've been a wonderful guest. And uh, once again, for our viewers and listeners, the book is Negotiating with Tough Customers. I cannot recommend this book enough. It is such a fabulous book written by a fabulous author. So please go out there, buy it. I actually have two versions of it. Um, I, I first picked up the hard copy. And then, I, and because it wasn't available in Bangladesh, I was so, uh, you know, scared of losing my only copy that I went straight to Google Play and I got it. I got the e version as well. So now I use both. Um, so yeah. Uh, so once again, do please go and get this uh, book. Uh, if anybody who's working with complex products, this is probably your go-to book. So uh, do please go ahead and uh, read it, uh, leave a review, and. Uh, as Steve had mentioned, if you want to get in touch with him, you can always uh, email him. So Steve, uh, once again, thanks again uh, for your time. And uh, I'll let you get back to your surfing and your semi-retirement. And I really hope to have you back someday uh, for a future episode. Uh, maybe if I get an opportunity to read your other books, you know, I would love to have you back on book and yeah, podcast to talk about it. And Omar, I hope we have an opportunity at some point where I can sign that book for you in person. So hopefully that will happen. Oh, absolutely. If you just, you don't have to tell me twice, I'll be right there in Thailand, you know, at some point, I'm sure that, you know, our paths will cross soon in real life. Okay. So, Steve, thank you so much once again, and uh, I wish you all the best and have a great It's been day. wonderful. Thanks, Omar. Thanks for the opportunity.